Welcome to the Humanist Perspective. I'm David Kepsel, the Executive Director of the Council for Secular Humanism. This series is produced by the Council for Secular Humanism, which is an international not-for-profit organization headquartered at the Center for Inquiry in Amherst, New York. Now, what is secular humanism? Well, secular humanists look to the natural and scientific for explanations and understanding of worldly phenomena, and we reject supernatural explanations. So, uh, secular humanists accept the methods of science and reason uh, in all areas uh, of human endeavor. Simply call the phone number on your screen or visit us online at secularhumanism.org. On today's show, I'll be talking with David Pulse. Hello, David. Glad to be here. <laughs> well, thank you for coming. Uh, David Pulse, uh, uh, you are uh, affiliated with Animatus Studio in Rochester, New York, right? Yes, I've been with um, Fred at the Animatus Studio for 12 years now, so I've been there a while. <laughs> okay, uh, and what is, your, what is your role there? Um, right now, I'm the creative director and direct folks on doing commercials and in-house productions for companies in, in town locally or um, nationwide if it's through the internet. And uh, I'm an animator and an independent filmmaker, so that's my connection with Animatus. Uh, and you come to us because, actually, I'll give a little bit of background here. Uh, one, of the person, uh, one of the people on staff here who's actually been a guest of this show before, uh, Ben Radford, took a course with you. He was very much impressed by a, a, uh, a clip that we're going to show today, an animation entitled True Believer. I want to talk a little bit about that uh, clip, about that segment. Um, first of all, um, how were you inspired to do this animation? Well, actually, uh, about 30 years ago, I read a book by Eric Hoffer um, called True Believer, and it had stuck in my head for a long time, and it had and it affected my life. So, 30 years later, once I got into animation, I uh, realized uh, putting it together with a song, with some music, that I could get some of those ideas out that I, that I had initially read in his book. Mm -hmm. And uh, and um, by doing so, um, it's been played around the world, at maybe a dozen or so festivals. Um, it's been accepted pretty well, and. Uh, Although there are some scenes at uh, some of the uh, festivals that are funded by uh, private groups or state community groups uh, are leery about showing and they have backed off from showing some of the showing in the festivals, although they could see the merit. Right. Um, yeah. what, is, what do you think the merit of that, of that clip is? We're going to watch it shortly. Uh, I'm sure our viewers will enjoy it. Um, tell me, first of all, how that book influenced you and uh, what you think the message is behind, behind True Believer. Um, as a young person and seeking for what I was going to, uh, I guess you could say, latch on to as a life philosophy or religion. And I was feeling on a lot of different religions and a lot of different groups and political groups, uh, finding out about them. Like certainly there was the SDS, the uh, young socialist democratic party that uh, was pretty radical after a while and seeking them out and reading his book I started to evaluate things very closely to say don't just latch on to something that you're gonna say that's the answer and you're gonna hang on to it no matter what I could see this in a lot of these dictators or um, that are in the in the film that uh, they had just latched on to the thing that they were going to, you know, fight to the death to, and really didn't evaluate their own moral uh, choices. Uh, started to get uh, broken down in the process, and and uh, just wanted to make everybody aware of that to evaluate in the process of when we're seeking out something to to promote or whatever that we evaluate it and make sure we don't go astray. Uh, certainly. Uh, so Bin Laden in 9/11 made it that much more uh, that much more aware of the situation that the right. uh, people they can lose their whole moralistic um, approach to life because they're so fixated on a certain on an individual or an idea yeah. or an ideology that that becomes consuming yeah. without, without some sort of critical thought. Yep. Okay. And certainly evaluating some of the dictators uh, that I use in this, Hitler or whatever, uh, it had moments when he just 
a few different things in their life could have made them communist mm -hmm. from Nazis. And actually he had marched in some communist uh, demonstrations. So uh, you can say, well, how could somebody be on such opposite sides that easily? And that's part of the thing. If you're looking so hard yourself, you can lose yourself in one of these uh, uh, philosophies or beliefs. Okay. Well, that, that's something that we're very interested in. I, I would like to uh, take a look now at, at your uh, animation, uh, True Believer. Uh, and uh, then I'll, when we come back, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how you, how you made it technically. And uh, if we'll sit back and uh, now take a look at, uh, at the clip, uh, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about it. Great.
That was True Believer uh, by Animata Studio, and uh, I'm here with Dave Pulse, who is uh, uh, the author of that work, um, and uh, others at Animata Studio. I want to talk a little bit about how uh, how you put this together technically, because I'm I'm intrigued by by um, by the look and feel of it. Um, how did you get? How did you start? The music was written first, mm -hmm. and I did the instrumentals and the and uh, everything in the music. Sometimes that's the way you have to do it when you're <laughs> an independent filmmaker. So you're yeah. also the composer of this music, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. And then off of that, I can start to um, uh, start thinking about what imagery I start to see. I have an overall concept of where I'm, I'm going to go, and I start. Usually, I'll start doing little 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 scribbles, little uh, like a storyboard. Yeah, storyboards, and I'll do it real quick. And actually, sometimes the quicker I do it, the freer the th the ideas flow. Mm -hmm. And these may change significantly because I'm an independent filmmaker. I can uh, change things on a moment. I didn't have ten people producing different parts of this, and I'm going to have to go and say, "Well, we're not going to use this or whatever." Right. I can change it immediately. Uh, originally, I was going to do this on film, so I had cut out characters that were all assembled with grommets on the the back that they all locked into. Okay. And uh, I started doing tests on uh, film stock and trying to do some of the effects where one character turns smoothly into the next character as they cross this line of where right. I could be either side. Um, it became very difficult on film, okay. at least for my expertise. So, so this was going to be for stop action. You were going to do stop action. Yep, stop, stop motion uh, filming of this and did some tests, and they weren't coming out as well as I had hoped. So uh, about, this, about that time, um, a program called After Effects came out, and I said, oh, that's the perfect thing. You mean the software yep, and, program? Yep, and took it all into the computer, took all these apart and scanned all the individual pieces and in that program I could let, uh, latch them together so when I moved the hand the whole arm moved I didn't have to move each piece individually okay so that made it tremendously uh, more uh, reasonable to do mm -hmm. and then my imagination grew from there of what I could do now um, in the computer the other characters uh, Osama and Saddam and and uh, some of the other characters were created in the computer, put texture to them, right. and took them into a 3D world. And so they had shadows that could turn all the way around. So right. then I was pretty excited I could go any place with this, uh, with these characters. And I, I enjoyed that you preserved the, the, the myth of them being these uh, two-dimensional characters. And so when you <laughs> turned them around, we saw you could play with that a bit. Um, when uh, now, when you do your animations, um, do you use this technique uh, for all your animations, or do you still do some stop motion? Oh uh, well, matter of fact, I'm just started a clay piece called Hate Preachers, <laughs> and I'm doing that, trying to do that mostly in clay. A little bit taken in the computer and do some manipulation of keying out things, but uh, I have I really latched onto this, uh, and I've done these photo montage pieces called uh, Sharks in the Water. And, mm -hmm one called Parallel Worlds that we're going to check out later, right. uh, where I'm taking photo uh, imagery and just combining it together to create this kind of surrealistic world. I, I, I tend to think the viewer lets it go a little bit more when, uh, when it's kind of um, mystical and not really, I'm there, but right. it's really a strange world. Which You know where I've seen, and we're going to watch Parallel Worlds next, um, but before we do, I, I, it, I'm just thinking now of what it reminds me a little bit of. There's a documentary called "The Boy Stays in the Kid Stays in the Picture." Have you seen that? No, I haven't. Um, it's a documentary, a commercial documentary that uses uh, techniques that actually remind me, uh, or that your your uh, uh, imagery reminds me of in parallel worlds. So uh, you might want to take that and take a look at that. It's becoming more and more um, popular. So you might have <laughs> you might have uh, ushered in a a style of filmmaking. Uh, let's uh, now um, take a look at a clip uh, that you just mentioned, Parallel Worlds, which gives us a little bit of your biography that I, I think the viewers would be interested in. And we'll come back and we'll, we'll wrap up talking about that. Okay. Okay? Great. Thank you. My name is Dave Paltz, and in 1973, at the age of 21, I went to work at the Rochester State Hospital. After three weeks of training, 
I was placed on one of the back wards as a mental hygiene therapist aide. For a few months, I worked on the semi-civilized day shift with nurses, a part-time social worker, and on one morning a week, a recreational therapist. We would also see a doctor briefly each week to prescribe medications for the patients. Because there were limited drugs available at the time, the state of New York provided its severely mentally ill patients with all the loose tobacco they could roll and smoke. We regularly handed out bags of red cheap tobacco, the worst smelling tobacco ever. In the winter months, the ward would become one thick cloud of smoke. Loose tobacco and cigarette butts were everywhere on the floor, in the chairs and covering the ping pong table, a favorite rolling spot. In those days, the patients had to clean their own wards. A lot of the therapy for patients revolved around sweeping and mopping the long hallways, expansive dorms, and worst of all, cleaning the bathrooms. On the day shift, some of us therapists would actually do some of the work with the patients. After a short time, I was rotated onto the evening shift. On evenings, manual labor by staff was against the employee's unwritten rules, and I was told in no uncertain terms not to do any of the work with the patients. Somehow, it was thought of as being beneath them, and that it weakened the staff control and the hierarchy of the patient-staff relations. I actually enjoyed being active, and continued to sweep and mop with the patients. This did not go over well. I didn't like working on the evening shift. The atmosphere seemed even further back in the dark ages than the day shift. One evening, an employee, who I knew vaguely from high school, was arguing with a patient over the TV channel that was going to be on. There were a number of patients who were watching the channel that the other patient wanted, but they knew their place and said nothing. The problematic patient was ordered to go to bed, but refused. As I walked into the day room, the employee had the patient pinned to the floor with his fist raised back to strike. I called out the employee's first name and grabbed his arm as it was coming down. His fist didn't make contact, but the impact of one employee holding back another staff member reverberated through that whole hospital that night. The supervising aide, with 40 years of experience, told me, quote, don't ever interfere like that again. Someday you may need our help, and walked away. The next evening, I was told that I was being put back on days where the hospital could supervise me more closely. It appears that the evening supervisor, who had offered his harsh advice, refused to work with me and said that all I did all evening was play my guitar. He was correct, I played my guitar, but it was always with the patients and it was always after we had swept and mopped the whole ward. He gave a scathing report about me and he recommended that my probation period be extended. Needless to say, I was glad to be back on days. I spoke to the very caring head nurse of our ward about what had happened. She then reported this to the supervisor of the whole unit. She came back to me and said, I was welcome to make a report about the incident but she also wanted to let me know that this same employee had been reported for five other incidents, some of them much worse than what I had seen. In each instance, the reporting employee had left and the problem employee remained. It appears that the hospital actually saw the reporting employee as the one creating the dilemma. Besides, they were usually the newer employee and they wouldn't be able to hack it in such a high-stress job anyway. It took employees with a tougher temperament to survive. Some of my co-workers had been MPs in Vietnam and had only recently returned. They never really fired the reporting employee. It just became so uncomfortable for them to work there that they voluntarily handed in their resignations. I resigned after two years. It is now 30 years later and my memories are shaken by the photographs from the Iraqi prisons. I am tearful that I was unable to affect a brutal situation as a young person, and I only hope that these photos will shake us all to find more adequate safeguards. It absolutely can change. It requires that our leaders be diligent in their supervision. Basic human decency should be one of our highest priorities, and it can no longer be the excuse of those responsible to say, gee, we never knew a thing about it. Well, they had better find out. It is their responsibility to have people under them 
that understand that they must report to their supervisors when these abuses occur. For our leaders to expect this to work, they will have to adamantly reinforce this concept down the whole chain of command, or they will be responsible for its failure. Hopefully, America and the world will use the abuses that we have witnessed in Iraq as the catalyst to hold our leaders more accountable. We've got the tougher stance to uphold, but that's exactly why it's so important not to let our fears overcome our decency. If we become like the terrorists, they've won. Right, and that was Parallel Worlds uh, by Animatus Studios, and that's a rather personal biographical uh, piece, isn't it, David? Yeah, very close to, <laughs> to me. Yeah, I know we watched it earlier, and, uh, and tell me what, um, how, that, how that affects you and what made you um, produce that piece. Um, again, it's been a long time simmering, uh, these uh, memories that I had when I worked at the psychiatric center, and... Uh, when I saw the photographs um, from Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq, it just struck me so hard. I had an emotional reaction to seeing this, uh, what was happening there, and it related to things that I had seen as a young person right. and couldn't correct and, and how hard it was to live with that for 30 years. Right. And, and it's interesting that I still know many people that uh, work in uh, the, the center and said, aren't you concerned about telling that story? <laughs> and I said, it's 30 years later and it, it needs to be told. And, right. And, uh, what were their concerns? And um, things have changed a bit, I imagine. Yes, things have changed greatly, but uh, I don't know what their main concern was that I would, uh, I had stopped an incident of abuse. So, um, the, um, the film actually showed in the Detroit Documentary Film Festival. It was really well received there, and it's out at, submitted to a lot of other festivals. So I hope it gets out and that story story is told, because the, the most important thing is that even though things have changed, right. it hasn't been eliminated totally. And as we see, we know that I'm basically telling how you could end it tomorrow right. in the services or prisons or wherever. Through accountability. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and that, they, that's what you said was missing in your incident, right? Yeah. And, so, and that appears to be an issue in, in present incidents in the military, right? Yeah. So it could be resolved if the head person says, I want this stopped and I want anybody that sees it to report it. It would stop immediately right. or be eliminated by vast amounts. So that's the main important um, now you do um, this work and the other one uh, have have political implications, have social and political implications. Is that uh, a, a major motivating influence in in your art, or is this just a a part of it? No, well, it's developed more. I'd say in the last five to six years. Uh, uh, I always based my pieces on very personal experiences. Initially, they had stories about uh, salmonella, food poisoning, and my experiences with that, and. Mm -hmm. People probably found those more humorous, but I started to develop, well, I have all the, this significant uh, you know, uh, ability to share ideas. Why don't I put more into things that I really feel invested in and wanting to change and affect? Right. Yeah, you know, we can sit here at a table and discuss <laughs> ideas, but oftentimes art is a, is a powerful motivating force for people that uh, discussion or... A conversation uh, doesn't necessarily always um, do the same. Yes. All right. I, I want to talk a little bit now about how people can uh, take a look at your other art. Uh, you do have a website. On that site, you'll see a lot of information about uh, people that can take 
uh, animation workshops that we provide through the studio. Mm -hmm. And they'll, I, actually, I'll be working with a lot of the, uh, the students. There's three teachers, and I can actually share immediately, you know, with them under the equipment that I use to make these at the studio right. and show them how they were made and how they can do essentially the same thing. You know, they'll build up their skills, but uh, right. that's as exciting to me as, as making films, as being able to share to other people because too many ideas and people's life's experience are lost because there's no record of them uh, made and uh, really animation uh, is one of the, uh, the most impactful medias that I know of that uh, allows a lot of people different creative ways to approach what they want to communicate. It's also a, a, a medium in which the tools are pro proliferating so that people can do more of this sort of work at home uh, and cheaply. Yeah. Uh, so um, we're seeing all over the web, for instance, all, all sorts of homegrown uh, uh, animations and in fact on television animation is, is more popular than ever I would say uh, with shows like South Park etc and there and Simpsons having such long and successful runs it seems to be a, a medium that has uh, is here to stay yeah one of the things I re like to reinforce because um, being a baby boomer that uh, that a lot of us uh, share our life experiences before we move on <laughs> And uh, and that there's ways to do it. You don't have to be a great artist. There's you know certainly ways of photo montage and and putting That's them in the computer and telling your story. So it's a record that hopefully moves us all along a little faster in our evolution. Right. Well, that's excellent. And I, I'm uh, very impressed by your work. And I hope our uh, our uh, viewers at home have. Uh, uh, enjoyed the clips as I have. Uh, thank you very much for sharing them with us. Uh, you do have a DVD which people can find on the web at your site if they go to animatastudio.com. Uh, and uh, well, we, we look forward to seeing more of your work in the future. And uh, it's been a great pleasure to meet you, Mr. Pulse. Nice to be here. And good luck with, uh, with all your endeavors in the future. Thank you. Thank you.